may be seated. Grab your Bibles and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We are going to be having communion today. This is a little different being outside, so you have to be patient with us today. I'm thankful we are meeting outside, although my allergies, anybody having allergy problems right now, especially? So I did the mowing yesterday here, and uh, I had a little sneezing spell this morning, itchy eyes, took some allergy medicine, hopefully I'm good. If not, I need a, need a backup. Any takers out there? George, did I see that hand? We're glad you're here with us. Thank you for being patient and praying for our church. I think we it was a church congregational vote, and I think we made the right decision based on people I'm hearing about with uh, very severe problems. But anyway, we are thankful you're here to meet with us, and I think you're going to be encouraged. This is my wife's. I don't know if she said favorite passage in Hebrews, but one of her favorite passages. And I think as we go through it, you will see why. We've been seeing warnings in Hebrews, and you're, you might be dreading those warning passages. Well, this is one of those positive passages, if you will. This is one of those passages, we've seen them scattered. I would say the, the positive text, if you will, that speak of the person and work of Jesus far outweigh in number the warning passages. And one of my questions for this week, or one of my statements for this week is, on number eight, I would invite you with me this week to read through the book of Hebrews again. Read through the book of Hebrews and maybe make note on what's said about the person and work of Jesus. Once again, use the positive, the person and work of Jesus, to keep you running, fixing your eyes on Him. We saw in chapter 12, right? We're to run with perseverance. We don't want any dropouts, as we saw last week. We don't want any of you to drop out. We want to see all of you finish well. If you fall down, we want to help you back up. If your knees are getting weak, we want to come along beside you. If you need a glass of water, we want to provide that, just not right now. We want to help each other. We're concerned not just for ourselves, but we want to fix our eyes on Jesus. We want to take all the things that we're seeing, the positive things about what Christ has done, but we also want to take to heart the warning passages. Today, turn with me to Hebrews 12, verse 18 through 24. The writer of Hebrews is going to use some pretty stark language. Actually, all he's going to do is walk us back through the encounter when the God of the universe, who is invisible, immaterial, creator of all things, he is eternal. How is he going to manifest himself to a sinful, fallen humanity? We've seen in the life of Moses, Moses is like, God, I just want to see you and experience your full glory. And God's like, you can't and live. That's one of the things I want you to wrestle through today. How does a being who is all wise, all powerful, holy, just, how is he to relate to? To humanity. We have two mountains today you can go to. Two mountains. Mount Sinai, if you take notes. Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Two experiences. One, you don't want to go to, which we'll look at first. Two, the second mountain is the mountain you must come to if you're going to be in the very presence of God for eternity. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts today as we listen to God's Word together as a New Covenant community. Let's pray together.
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we are out in creation, we're thankful that not only did you create the universe, but you have sought to redeem fallen humanity. Thank you for all of those today who are experiencing the, new, the blessing of the new covenant, who have been given new hearts to follow you, that you've put your spirit within them to dwell within them until they meet you in glory. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the, uh, the atoning work that you did on the cross that perfected everyone who's in the new covenant to obtain eternal inheritance. Oh Lord, would you encourage us today through your word to focus our attention on Mount Zion, the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and all that's said about it today. May it stir our affections. May what we see today stir our affections to live for that kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hebrews 12, the writer is going to walk us back to Exodus 19. I don't believe as I look out at the congregation today, we have any Jewish believers, maybe I'm wrong, people who, have, who grew up with Judaism, or maybe you're here, you're not Jewish, but you practice Judaism, and now that you're a confessing Christian, you're tempted to go back to Judaism. That's what the writer is warning you not to do all the way through this book. That Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. And we want to stay with him and not go backwards in time. So today we're going to see the Mosaic Covenant delivered on what was called Mount Sinai. And I want you to hear the threatening description, the terrifying description, if you will. Of what is said. So Hebrews 12. In verse 18. For. This is after he's already encouraged you to stay in the race. It's given you a few warnings. Now he says. For you have not come to a mountain. That can be touched. And to a blazing fire. And to darkness and gloom and whirlwind. And to the blast of. Of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken for they could not bear the command even if a beast touches the mountain it will be stoned so terrible was the sight that Moses said I am full of fear and trembling but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord, and everybody said, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. This is God's holy word this morning. And I just want you to try and imagine with me what it would have been like to be the children of Israel who've come out of Illinois, the land of Egypt, let's just say, the land of slavery. You've come out of bondage into, is this, is this heaven? Your response is, no, it's Iowa. How many remember that? What's it from? The Field of Dreams. So imagine that. We, we've crossed the river, which is the Red Sea. We've crossed the Mississippi, the mighty Mississippi. God did incredible wonders, dragging us by his mighty hand out of that land of slavery. And now we're at a mountain. Does Iowa have any mountains? I don't think so, but pretend with me. And you are told Moses is to come up, but don't let any of the people, as I look out here, don't let any of the people come near, not even an animal, lest they die. 
You might ask that. I asked that question on one of on your sheet this morning. Why is there such a vast difference between Mount Sinai and the Mount Zion experience? Compare the two this week. Take time to think about, A, Mount Sinai, the description, at least seven descriptors about Mount Sinai, and then in the other column, Mount Zion. Folks, what we see in the text before us out of Exodus 19 is God in His pure holiness coming down and manifesting Himself on this mountaintop and as you read it, if you go back and read Exodus 19 this week, fire, trembling, earthquake. How many of you love thunderstorms? But what if a thunderstorm, lightning and thunder, is like right outside your window? Martin Luther, when that happened, lightning struck nearby him, and he fell down on the ground, and he said, St. Anne, I'll become a priest. I mean, I don't know if any of us have ever experienced the power of a severe thunderstorm right in the midst of it. Multiply that by thousands. This is what's happening on Mount Sinai. God in His pure holiness manifesting Himself to this group of Israelites that He has brought out of bondage, out of Egypt, and has taken them to the promised land. He is making a covenant with them. Now some of you might be like, oh, I would love to experience that. And what the writer is saying, no, you don't. Let me just say this. Anyone that's here today who is not trusting in Jesus, all those people that we know who think that God is some grandfatherly, easy pushover, some people have this view of God, no problem with me. When I get up there, it's not going to be a problem because I'm a pretty good person. God's going to lay all my good works on one side and all my bad works on the other, and I, and I think I'm going to be fine. When they really have no clue who they're even dealing with. God in His holiness, unmediated, if you will, we couldn't exist. Careful. You would think that would change them forever. That when God sets up the priesthood in the Old Testament, they would follow exactly that because God did accommodate them to give them a way to have a relationship with Him, to have sins forgiven, all temporary, as we've seen in the book of Hebrews, until the coming high priest who would give himself as a final atonement that would perfect them for how long? What are we seeing in the book of Hebrews? The book of Hebrews has already pointed out that God in His holiness, the high priest of the Old Testament, could only enter into the Holy of Holies how many times a year? One time a year. One person. Imagine that. Only one person. When God makes His presence known in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. This is what we see in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Covenant. It's a frightening covenant, folks. And the New Covenant, this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. The, if you understand the New Covenant, it is, as the writer says, better. We have a better covenant. We have better promises. And look, everybody who's outside of Christ today in all kinds of false religions, all their man-made ideas, when they try to approach God outside of the covenant work of Jesus, they experiencing, they're going to experience this terrifying reality. Now, how many want to come to Mount Zion? <laughs> Notice what he says. By the way, I do have a bunch of clothespins up here trying to hold my pages from flying all over the place. So chapter 12, we see all of these things that they experienced on that day. Begging, no further word. Trembling, 
even Moses. But you, verse 22, and if you write in your Bibles like I do, I put a contrast symbol. The author in today's text, chapter 12, verse 18 through 24, is showing us a stark contrast. Mount Sinai, here's what it was like. Mount Zion, this is what it's like. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels. Let's just stop and walk through this. Mount Zion, many would say is all the references in the Old Testament would be to Jerusalem, a hill in Jerusalem, or synonymous with Jerusalem. But what we're seeing today is not the earthly Jerusalem or Zion. It is the heavenly realm. Notice the, how the writer describes what we would say is heaven itself. These are descriptors. It's not all that the Bible has to say. But for this writer, he's painting a picture of which reality do you want? If you go back to Judaism, mm, can you keep that covenant? How well are you going to do? Under the new covenant, this is what we experience. Notice that he says, you have come to Mount Zion. If you're a Christian today, if you say, yeah, Kendall, I'm a Christian, born again, I know it. You have already come, it's the already and not yet. You already have a seat in heaven, as Ephesians says. You have already come to Mount Zion. And this, this experience, the description that's given, is the city of the living God. Now one of my questions today, as I thought about this, was what will the conditions be like in the city of God versus, let's say, the city of Chicago or Portland? Just to pick two cities in the United States that continually have problems. Not saying that Burlington's perfect, it's not. But if you were to compare the city of man, fallen cities, fallen environment, imagine what all goes on daily in these two large cities. What is going on around the world versus the city of God? Do you ever think about that? That you and I are going to experience, what would it be like as Jesus prayed? How are we to pray? Your what? Your kingdom come? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? How many would like what's going on in earth to be exactly the will of God? Nobody else. Okay, great. All right. Bunch of, bunch of pagans here today. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? Perfection. The city of God. Worship. Perfection. Eternally under... Forever coming to a, a fuller understanding. I, years ago, there was a conference in Minneapolis where the whole topic was heaven. They had experts come in, Randy Alcorn and others who've written on heaven. And one of the things that caught my attention was, is God, if God is infinite, never, never think of heaven as boring. Some of you have admitted to me that as a kid or even as a grown-up, Heaven frightened you because who wants to sit on a cloud playing a harp for all eternity? Raise your hand. Okay, two or three people. That's not the picture of heaven. The picture of heaven is just briefly given here. If this is all that we had, it would be enough to whet your appetite to say, I want to live for that kingdom. I want to make sure that I am in that kingdom forever. And what's pictured here is if you're a Christian, you're already a part of that kingdom, yet not physically, you're not there yet. But it's written in such a way that you are. It's, it's the not 
yet fully consummated. But enough to say, that's what I want to live for. The Mount Zion is the city of the living God. The God who created all things. The God who's the judge of all things. The one who brought the universe into existence and sustains it. Has brought about redemption. We get to be a part of that city forever. Now we know in the book of Revelation that the city of God comes to earth. That's the new heaven and new earth. The God, what has fallen in creation, and God is going to bring it back around and bring about, as the end of the book of Revelation says, a new heaven and a new earth. You see the city, what? The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And what is that saying? God will dwell with man. Outside are those. I won't talk about because I want to keep this positive today because that's what the writer is doing. Mount Sinai, unmediated holiness is not what you want to experience. So he says, not only is it the Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So he's not talking right now about the physical Jerusalem, where God made his presence known in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. We're talking about when a believer dies today, and Patty, we're thankful Patty is alive today, but all of us know it could have ended badly. It could end badly for any of us this week. People die of COVID, all kinds of diseases, cancer, heart attacks, aneurysms, right? We know that. For a believer, is to be absent from the body, and where? Present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 through 8. Paul said, my desire is to depart and be with Christ in first, uh, first, first chapter of Philippians. That's how he lived his life. He's like, Lord, if you keep me here, I want to live for the progress and joy of other Christians because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, so I'm in a win-win situation. This is a great way to live. As long as the Lord keeps me here, I'm going to live for the progress and joy of other people's faith, serving the Lord, no matter what my occupation is, whether I'm retired or in school, whether I'm a baker, a banker, or a bricklayer, wherever I'm at, whatever station in life, my ultimate goal is to glorify God, and I can do that. And then when I die, to be absent from this body is to be in the city of the living God. With what? Full access. What's the book of Hebrews been saying? You have full access. Hebrews 10, 19. You have confidence that when you die to enter the holy place, how? Hebrews 10, 19 says, by the blood of Jesus. You have confidence to enter that holy place, to be right in the very presence of God, based on the atoning work of Jesus, as we're going to see. The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels. Some of your translations will say, myriads of angels in festive gathering. Some connect that festive assembly to the church of the firstborn. And it's a matter of interpretation with the Greek text, and I'm not going to get into the technical aspect of it, but let me just say, it's all of it. In heaven is one festive gathering of angels, which you've never seen. Myriads. Thousands upon thousands of angelic creatures. Think about, how many of you love this creation? This week I was fascinated with, I know you may not like them, but cicadas. Cicadas are amazing. They live in the ground. Some of them 17 years. They, they come up out of the ground. They come out of their shell and transform. They look like a little alien just, this world is filled with amazing creatures. Monarch butterflies, whales, sharks, cardinals, blue jays, hummingbirds, giraffes. And we could list thousands of species. What God also created are spiritual beings who do His bidding, which you and I have never, to my knowledge, have witnessed. This is exciting. The city of God, myriads of angelic creatures worshiping to the church of the firstborn, to the assembly of the firstborn. The firstborn was Israel. Not only did you have the firstborn children, 
Firstborn came to have the idea of preeminence. If we're in Jesus Christ, we're a part of not only the local church. Have you ever heard of the church militant? I didn't think so. How many have ever heard of the church militant versus the church triumphant? Let me just explain that. If you ever see it for years, I didn't know what it was talking about. It's this idea that right now there's a church, an assembly of God's people in heaven. That's the church triumphant. God's people of all time already conquered what? Through the blood of Jesus. They're made perfect as we're going to see. That's the church in glory. The church triumphant. Right now, the church militant means what? We're still doing spiritual warfare. We're still in a realm of darkness. We, we live in, How many agree that we live in a fallen world and it seems to be digressing, at least here for right now? In the last year, would you have ever imagined we would see and hear the things that we're seeing and hearing? Folks, this world could get, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. The way I read the text. Before Jesus comes again. I love this idea that the church will continue to battle satanic forces. Spiritual dark forces. Spiritual dark ideas and philosophies. That's the church militant, if you will. We're doing battle. We're sharing the gospel, seeing people plucked out of the dominion of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of Jesus, according to Colossians 1. You and I, we're a part of that kingdom. You and I, there's, there's only two types of people here. Still a part of that kingdom of darkness, or you've been transferred into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. Paul in Colossians 1 talks about this transfer. You've been transferred from one kingdom. Paul, in the book of Acts, said, that's what God sent me to do. To preach the gospel, to see people leave one kingdom by God's grace and experience the supernatural kingdom at work in their lives. If you've been born again, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you're a part of this kingdom that's still in battle spiritually. Also, says, who are enrolled in heaven. That's another amazing statement. A role enrolled in heaven. Right now, if you're a Christian, you're already enrolled there. You already, I see most of you are sitting in seats. Paul in Ephesians says, we're already seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. Is that exciting? Right now, as you sit here on this physical earth, you also, the already, not yet, have a seat there with your name on it. Right here, he's encouraging them. Right now, because you're part of this new covenant community, you've come already to Mount Zion, to live, the city of the living God, to myriads of angels, to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God. Don't forget. How many would say, if I don't know anybody else in heaven, I'm glad I'm there? I don't know why I don't see all hands. Is God the most important thing to you in all the universe that if you don't know anyone else, you don't care in that sense because your number one goal is to be with God? Folks, you should be there. Yes, I, I pray to God. I hope. I know I do have. But listen, if not, I, I want to be with the creator of the universe forever. Notice what it says there. And to God. You come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to myriads of angels, to the church of the firstborn, and to God, who, by the way, is the judge of all. This God we've been reconciled to, who's going to judge the whole world. That's why in the book of Acts, why are we to preach the gospel? Because there's coming a day in which God is going to judge the world. Why are we to be sharing the gospel with people? Because God has fixed today. How many of you have calendars on your phone? Right now, on God's calendar of events, Judgment Day is coming. If you've been studying with us on the book of Romans on Tuesdays, my verdict has already been given on that day. If you're a Christian, 
Your verdict has already been given. You stand declared righteous in Christ based on His atoning work. And to the spirits of the righteous, notice this, made what? Perfect. How many of you have loved ones who are with the Lord right now? Raise your hand. Where's their body? Their body's either dissolved, or our bodies go back to dust. If, if they're in the ground long enough. I, I, I don't want to get morbid here for a second, but we live in a fallen world, and when our bodies die, they go in the ground. What happens to the spirit, soul? Absent from the body, Paul says, present with the Lord. So if you were to name your loved ones, people you know who are with the Lord, they're completely sanctified. They're made perfect, all based on what Christ has accomplished, their high priest. Imagine that. Imagine your loved one. Were they perfect here on earth? Could you mention their flaws or their shortcomings? Yeah. Guess what? They're made perfect. Based on what Jesus Christ has done, they have been, that's why I love the description here of heaven. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. As we've seen in the book of Hebrews, how is that perfection accomplished? By the blood of Christ. That's what the new covenant work has done. You're like, where at? Well, let me invite you to go back and read all of Hebrews again this week. Chapter 2, we see he made a, a, a propitiation. Chapter 1, you'll see in verse 3 that he made a purification for sins and then sat down as if the work is completed. Chapter 7, he ever li lives to intercede for us. Chapter 7, 8, and 9, Pictures him as a high priest. He went in and sacrificed himself. How many times? The author keeps saying this thing. Once and for all. His first coming came to deal with sin. And he did deal with it. Praise God. For this description here. And to Jesus. So you're coming to Mount Zion. And he's giving all of these descriptors. Just like he did with Mount Sinai. Gave all of those serious warnings. At least seven of them. Here he's giving us at least seven descriptors of what Mount Zion, the city of God, is like. And to Jesus. We're coming to Jesus, and he says, the mediator of the new covenant. Remember what we've said about the new covenant? Promise in the Old Testament. Christ on the night in which he was betrayed. We're getting ready to take communion. It says this cup represents what? The blood of the new covenant, which he was getting ready to inaugurate. Which brings about, according to Hebrews, the complete satisfaction for your sins. The complete purging of your sins. Our high priest has made that final sacrifice. Is this a good reminder, folks? We're coming to the city of God in which we have a mediator... Sinai, unmediated. Do you need a mediator? Everybody needs a mediator. How are you getting to heaven? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I think God's going to... Nope, it's going to be a very sad day for you, friend. Very sad day. You're going to be totally floored, literally. Without a mediator. It's a frightening thing to fall into the hands of the living God, who is a consuming fire. Amen? You should not shrink back from loving the full attributes of God. But the same God has provided an atoning mediator, the Lord Jesus, who brings us to Himself. So we've been in the book of Hebrews for a while. I mean, uh, the book of Romans for a while on Tuesdays. We're, on Hebrews. We're in Hebrews on Sundays. Let me just read to you a description. A passage in Romans 5. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. How did this reconciliation take place? While we were enemies, we were reconciled through the death of His Son. Verse 9 says, now that we've been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. We're going to take communion today. Communion. Celebrating somebody's death. We're here today 
and we're celebrating the death of somebody. We're celebrating the death. Of, yes, we know he rose from the dead triumphantly. But when we take communion, Paul says, we are celebrating the death of the Lord Jesus until he comes. So as you hold this bread and you hold the cup, and it's only for those who are trusting in the atoning work of Jesus, I want you to celebrate with us today. The church gathered here on earth, pondering and thinking about these eternal truths and what we have waiting for us. This world, as we're going to see, is going to be shaken. But we have a city, friends, that can't be shaken. That's the city that we're a part of. Now the wind has blown my scriptures all around, so i got to get back there. Hebrews 12, let's finish it up. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood, we've already seen this in the book of Hebrews, the imagery is of the Old Testament, taking blood in and sprinkling, just as the, the Mosaic Covenant was sprinkled with blood, Jesus' blood has sprinkled, if you will, has cleansed our sins as the high priest. And here's an odd statement, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. The first one murdered, whose blood cried out, Vengeance. Abel's blood is speaking. Jesus' blood is better. Which speaks better. We have a new covenant which is better than the Mosaic covenant. Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. He's better than the angels. He has a better sacrifice because it's complete. Why would we ever turn away from Him? Why would we ever want to leave Friends, I pray today that God would use this message of what we have in store. As we're running this race, keeping our focus on Jesus, that this positive picture of heaven would motivate us. His blood speaks better. Because it brings about what? Complete redemption. Complete redemption. Let me read a couple passages. One out of Luke's Gospel. You may want to write these down and just think about them later. As I thought about some passages that would help us reflect on what we see with the Lord's Supper. Luke chapter 22. Let me just read it. This is Jesus on a Thursday evening. Celebrating the Passover, by the way. He takes the bread and he takes the cup. And this is what he said. This is why we're doing communion today. Jesus broke it. This is Luke twenty two nineteen, 19. Saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after they had eaten. Saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Amen? Are you thankful that you're a believer today? Today, That you are already a part of that Mount Zion, that city of God? God is going to call you home one day. What kind of treasure do we have to encourage us in this walk until he calls us home? Let's pray together. Lord, you have given us so many great truths to encourage us in this race. It is only, Lord, we recognize by your grace that we're even here today. We confess with Paul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. We are so thankful for all that you have accomplished for your new covenant people. You brought about complete redemption through our great mediator, the Lord Jesus. And we're celebrating right now as we pass out the elements. We're celebrating His bodily death on our behalf. We're celebrating His inauguration of the new covenant, which brings about complete forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Spirit, and so many other blessings.
Thank you for each one that's here today who is following, following in obedience with joyful hearts to participate in this communion time. Lord, we pray once again that nobody here is trusting in Mount Sinai. What a frightful day that will be. May they trust only in Jesus and what he's accomplished. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Man, if you would come, we're going to just hang on, Addy, before you start the song. We're going to come. They're going to come and grab the trays.